Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's equine educational webinar. Thank you for joining us tonight for another topic in the VMC Animal Health Education Series. Our topic tonight will focus on temporal hyoid osteoarthropathy. THO is a disease that affects the temporal hyoid joint of horses, resulting in a loss of mobility and pain in this area. Dr. Booth, a third year resident, is conducting research into modifying a surgical technique that is a safe approach for horses by reducing surgical time, anesthesia time, and intraoperative complications. We're grateful to have you all in attendance tonight, and on behalf of our team, I would like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. My name is Mindy Mean, Senior Development Officer in the College of Veterinary Medicine. I work with our clinicians at the Leatherdale Equine Center in developing educational outreach webinars throughout the year. The Leatherdale Equine Center includes the Piper Equine Hospital, Large Animal Hospital, and our West Metro Equine Ambulatory Practice, which is located out in Long Lake, just west of Minneapolis. We are honored to serve many large animals along with their families each and every day while educating the next generation of large animal clinicians. The VMC Animal Health Education Series features our leading experts covering a variety of topics in veterinary medicine that provide relevant health and medical information that will provide for a better life and well-being for animals and people. With questions we received prior to tonight's, to tonight's webinar and those that are asked this evening, we will do our best to cover the topics that have been asked most frequently during the Q&A at the end of the program. Please note that if your pre-submitted question or questions you have, you may have asked tonight relates to your horse's specific medical care, it's, it's best to contact either the Piper Equine Hospital or the West Metro Equine Practice directly for a consultation so your horse's care is personally assessed. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for this evening, Dr. Allison Booth. Dr. Booth is a third year resident, he's primarily at the UM, he's primarily at the uh, Piper Equine Hospital and Large Animal Hospital. Our specialty hospital is located on the St. Paul campus. Her areas of interest include lameness, sports medicine, and sports surgery. We're grateful and appreciative to have Dr. Booth of the Piper Equine Hospital join us this evening. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Booth. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so this, my presentation, as Mindy said, is going to focus on temporohyoid osteoarthropathy, which lay terms for that, and a lot of people will call it THO. This is a subject that has been near and dear to my heart throughout my time here at the university. Um, we see about probably four, anywhere from four to 10 cases a year, and we are able to luckily do surgery on most of those cases. Um, and it's been a big topic of my research since I've been a resident here at the university. So I'm gonna just review slash teach you a little bit about um, the anatomy that's involved with this disease. Um, explain what the disease itself is, how we detect the disease via the clinical signs, what to expect your horse could do, um, the diagnostics that are available to us to treat them or to diagnose them, and then different treatment options available to us as well as the prognosis associated with those treatment options. So the hyoid apparatus is an apparatus, as you can see in this picture down here, that suspends the tongue and connects it up here to the temporal bone of the um, calvarium, right outside the calvarium. And what it does is the, this whole apparatus moves not just the tongue, but a ton of um, upper airway structures, including the larynx and the pharynx. Um, the areas that we'll be focusing on the most are the stylohyoid bone, which is this big bone right here, and then the serratohyoid bone. And where the disease process takes place, the temporohyoid part of that is unfortunately not quite as visible in this picture, but it's happening up here where the stylohyoid bone um, articulates or connects with the petrous temporal bone and can become inflamed. So our biggest players, again, are the serratohyoid bone. He'll be um, a key part in our surgeries that I talk about, and then the stylohyoid bone is um, part of the area that gets diseased. Um, the reason I show you this picture, it's a little bit of a, obviously it's an illustration, but it's to outline and kind of explain how many vessels and nerves. The black are different vessels that run throughout the guttural pouch. 
Um, and then the kind of grayish ones are all the different nerves. And as you can see, it's pretty intricate um, with all the vessels. And then what's not shown here, but I have in a couple other slides are all the vessels that run along the hyoid apparatus where this is again the stylohyoid bone and this is the serratohyoid bone and there's a ton of important big vessels that run in this area as well as this area and that becomes important when we go to do surgery on a case with THO. Um, so this is kind of just showing the intricacies of how much is going on um, in your horses, basically their guttural pouch and airway. So when we pass a scope up a horse's nose um, to look in their guttural pouch, whether for THO or any other reason, this is the image we see and what we want to see. And the biggest things for us to look at here is the guttural pouch is divided into two areas. Um, and the, there's a medial area and a lateral. So an area that's kind of towards the middle of the head and then an area that's towards the outside. And all of these, this is a vessel, a very big um, artery, and then we have nerves coming down here that are labeled. All of these can get inflamed when and become um, what we call neuritis when this bone, which is again, this is another view of the stylohyoid bone, when this bone gets diseased or proliferative or some fractured or anything like that. And kind of up here, is right on the kind of the brink of the articulating part with the petrous temporal bone. It's not quite, you can't see the actual other bone that it's articulating with, but it's in that area. So we start to notice disease process kind of in this area. So what is it and who does it affect? This is back in the day, I'll say it was um, believed to be mostly a prog progressive disease of the middle ear. And over time, that has changed a little bit, but it's, the ear is still a very important part to this disease. Um, I got a couple questions about, do horses, are certain breeds predisposed? And the answer is no, but we do see that quarter horses are overrepresented. And the likelihood of that is mostly because in America, we have more quarter horses and a lot of the studies have been done in America. There are a couple studies in Europe and most of them are in warm bugs because quarter horses just aren't as prevalent over there. So I think here in the United States where we do a lot of these studies, we tend to just see more quarter horses because they're one of our largest populations. So I tend to see in our study here about, I think over half of the horses are quarter horses, but I don't think that it is not correlated for that to be genetic. It's just a predisposition. You can see this in any age. Um, there, the horse that I had in the first slide, that age horse was six months old, a six month old thoroughbred in Japan. And I've seen it in three-year-olds, five-year-olds, and I've seen it in older horses and 20-year-olds. So that's kind of the tricky part about it is it can progress really quickly kind of out of nowhere. Um, and we don't really know ultimately why. And then horses that crib, they were, when we're looking at this 30% of cases is basically all the cases that present to a hospital, 30% of those cases have roughly been, a, have had a history of cribbing. So if your horse is a cribber, he potentially, he or she could potentially be more predisposed to developing the disease, but that doesn't mean that just because he cribs, he'll get it, just potentially could. So what causes it? Um, so back in the 90s, it was originally associated with um, inner ear infection or um, otitis media and externa. And what that is, let me see, um, is where this arrow is pointing. That's the petrous temporal bone and the stylohyoid kind of articulating. And then the guttural pouch is down here, which this is the part of the um, stylohyoid bone we see when you scope your horse that I showed you. And the ear, which I have in another picture, is right here is where the ear canal is roughly. So it was believed that horses would get basically an ear infection and it would spread and cause inflammation and contamination of the temporal hyogenate, the stylohyoid bone will get inflamed, and then you'd start to see these disease processes, which I'll kind of um, explain in a little bit. But 
what we have found kind of over time through a lot of different studies is that it is likely more caused from just simple osteoarthritis, just the horse using its bones to breathe, to eat, to swallow, all of that. And over time, it becomes proliferative, just like if we go on a jog and we run and we end up getting arthritis from in our knees or elbows or anything like that, just like dogs can get. It's just another joint in the horse that gets arthritis. And unfortunately, unlike joints in the legs, this one you can't just inject and hope to quiet down inflammation, unfortunately, it can progress quickly and become potentially life-threatening. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble. There we go. Okay. Um, so how does it all happen? So something incites the bone, whether it's usage or potentially an ear infection. And the bone, the stylohyoid bone and that petrosemporal bone, they fuse together and they become very big and thickened. And it changes the way the apparatus moves in the horse's mouth. And so some people will notice, can notice the disease if you get your, your horse's teeth floated because now you've changed. We have this disease process going on. We haven't noticed it. And all of a sudden we open the horse's mouth and something changes with the horse or the horse becomes uncomfortable or reactive or something like that. And that's because we the whole dynamic of the apparatus has changed. It's basically in a way you can think of it as being less motile. And what can happen is that the, the speechless temporal bone or the stylohyoid or both can end up fracturing. And when that happens, that's sometimes when you see clinical signs acutely and all of a sudden you start to worry, what's going on with my horse? Um, and then it'll start to heal and form a callus and the callus will create neuritis and contribute to pain um, in the nerves in that area, which are contributing to what you see as an owner. And that's where these facial nerve and vestibular nerve, those nerves are the ones that get the most compressed because of the area that they run in associated with that joint. And when they get inflamed, you can see very um, scary clinical signs, which we'll go over in a little bit. And it can be intimidating when you um, observe them. So what these, in the early stages, we'll start at the early stages, the clinical signs can be as simple as head tossing, ear rubbing, they don't want to take the bit, they don't want to come into a frame, they start to get head shy, um, you ask them to come into a frame and move forward and they don't want to, and you've ruled out that their back's okay, their legs are okay, all of that, and then when you touch their pole, they get sensitive. All of those could potentially be early signs that a horse has THO. Now, most of the time, those signs we don't typically diagnose in that time frame because most times people work through it, they'll turn the horse out, it, they don't want to continue working up the, the, the issue, they'll sell the horse, whatever. But sometimes the most common way that we see the disease is in the acute phase when owners start to notice changes in their facial appearance. As you can see over here, we have a horse. This is a horse exhibiting facial nerve deficits. And what I mean by that is its facial nerves inflamed and it's no longer able to do its job. And you can see that the muzzle starts to deviate to the left here and it, the right ear is drooping. So this horse has right-sided facial nerve paralysis, and this can be the first way we recognize THR. I've had a couple cases where we diagnose it and can catch it, and some horses are lucky enough to just start to experience it, something as simple as an ear droop and muzzle deviation. However, another thing with the facial nerve is they can develop horrible corneal ulcers because they lose the ability to blink their eye and their ability to produce tears. So we've had a ton of cases where we have to put in SBLs and treat the corneal ulcer. We've had some have to turn into nucleation. Sometimes we'll have to suture the eye shut to give it that chance to heal because they're not able, the horses aren't able to produce the tears themselves and they're not able to, um, to get rid of the ulcer. So sometimes we can do like a partial closure of the eye to help them out so we can try to save the eye, but sometimes it can go too far and unfortunately we have to nucleate. 
And then another sign they can have with or without, sometimes they'll get just the facial nerve deficit, sometimes they'll get this vestibular cochlear nerve deficits, or sometimes they will get both together. And it, there, it's very case dependent. And the vestibular cochlear nerve is the scariest one, especially for owners when you guys go out and you find your horse and they were fine a minute ago and then all of a sudden you come out and they're super ataxic, meaning they don't know where their feet are, they're not comfortable walking, their head will tilt to the left or to the right. Sometimes their eye gets something called nystagmus and it'll go back and forth and the horses see super uncoordinated. The horses themselves sometimes can get really stressed and nervous when they feel like they've lost control of their body and they're not able to do something. And that means that the vestibular cochlear nerve is involved. So when we diagnose this, when we have a horse that presents with something as simple as head tossing or a horse that presents with ataxia and discoordination and an ear droop, one of the things we can do as veterinarians or here at the university or in the field or through a primary vet is we can pass a scope up just like I showed you in the veteral pouch. We pass it up the nose and pass it into, into the pouch and we evaluate the style hired bone. And as you can see here, this stylohyoid bone is extremely large, it's proliferative, it's bumpy, it's not a happy looking bone, and it's already, you can see that it's compressing nerves, where if you look over here on this normal bone, this is very small and very far away from the nerves. So this is what we want to see, and when we look in a horse with, that has THO, this is what we see. So this is a huge indicator that, hey, we might have, um, we likely have THO going on, causing this horse this signs of ataxia or this ear droop, or this could be why the horse is head tossing. We can also take radiographs. My favorite view to do for these, um, and this can be done, again, by your primary vet in the field, and we can take what's called a DV. So it's shooting, the beam is shooting at the horse's head and then the plate is underneath the horse's chin so that we can highlight that temporal high joint. And in this view, what, we're, what we look for as veterinarians is we're looking to see what does the joint look like? So over here's normal, here's the stylohyoid bone articulating with the um, petrous temporal bone and you have a nice smooth line all the way down. And then over here on this right uh, side of the horse, we have um, a big bulbous thickening of structure and then a thicker stylohyoid bone that kind of courses down. And this one is what I would call diffusely thick. The whole body of the bone is bigger than it should be, especially when you have this nice normal one to compare it to. And then again, on a lateral, I wouldn't say we do a lot of lateral views, but you're looking at this area, the peaches temporal bone, and this particular area is pointing out a little fracture that's within the bone. And you can see how close the ear is, you can kind of see the outline of the ear canal, which is this whole area here. The other thing we can do here at the university is we are lucky enough to have a standing CT, and that gives us the ability to be able to get 3D images. So a CT is just a radiograph in 3D. It is nothing more than that, and it helps gives us a lot of information. So if that's ever an option for people, we, we definitely try to do that so that we can really see what's going on. So in this first picture, these are two normal stylohyoid bones, very happy looking guys. And then in this middle picture up here, this stylohyoid bone over here on the right is extremely angry and thickened, and this one over here on the left is not normal. So this horse would have bilateral disease, and this horse would, in theory, likely be showing us clinical signs on this right side, but maybe down the road would end up have, showing clinical signs on the other side. And then in this picture, you can see there's a fracture this, within the, plurf, the proliferation of the stylohyoid bone. So the bone itself got super thick and then it fractured up and through the petrous temporal bone. And then over here, just having a nice normal nice normal bone. And then again, you can see the severity. Some of these are extremely severe. This is another big fracture within the stylohyoid bone communicating up with the petrous temporal bone. And then these arrows are just pointing down here. This is the articulation of the serratohyoid with the um, stylohyoid. And this is a different view of that same articulation. And basically what it's showing is 
it's you can tell it's different there's thickening here the serrato hard bone starts to also take a beating from the changes of the dynamics of that of the style of hyoid bone if that makes sense so back in i think this was roughly came out yeah in 2002 um, this study was basically a summary of horses that presented to a hospital with THL. And in these 33 horses, and I, I try to show you guys studies because it, I think it, this is a good disease in the sense of how much, how far veterinary medicine has come and how we change our, our techniques to only get better and better all the time. And this study just looked at what happens when horses present with THO and what is their prognosis and what are their clinical signs and just trying to get more information about the disease and what to expect. None of these horses had surgical treatment. This was all done by what we call medical management, which I'll go into in a couple slides. But basically they diagnosed most of these horses with guttural, the guttural pouch endoscopy, which I showed you, and they felt that that yielded more sensitive results and they were easily able to detect it um, more efficiently than radiographs. So that's why most people start with scoping the horses before radiographing. Um, the meaning like in the more subtle diseases, you're more likely to pick it up with um, an endoscope versus um, having your vet take rads. And then of these uh, horses that present, most horses will present with one-sided disease. They had basically that 25%, 25 of them ended up having bilateral disease when they looked at both stylohyoid bones. And with the uh, help of medical treatment, only 63% of horses were able to be used um, athletically again, which is not a prognosis as we as veterinarians love. It's better than 50%, which is great, but we as veterinarians like to see a higher prognosis of returning back to why you have the horse in general. And sometimes the biggest thing this study showed too is that clinical signs can sometimes take up to two years to completely resolve. So it's something you have to be patient for, unfortunately, sometimes. So when we're treating, what is our goal? The biggest thing is we want to stabilize the horse. If they're coming in acutely and they're ataxic, we wanna make sure we stabilize the horse and we wanna decrease the inflammation at the fracture site. And what that typically means is treating them with NSAIDs or steroids, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, sometimes we'll add in, and I will say most of the time we add in a long course of um, antibiotics. So that way, if there's any chance there's a fracture, if that fracture is getting into the calvarium or causing changes, sometimes they can get um, a pneumo calvarium, which just means air within the calvarium, which is where the brain sits, and they can become extremely ataxic. And I had one case do that, and it um, we got her through it, but it was really hard to see her like that. Um, and it can be very scary for owners and the horse itself. Um, so that's why we treat with antimicrobials is to make sure that we're covering anything that can happen like that. If there is a chance there's middle ear disease, then that way we're treating any sort, sort of infection. Um, we wanna make sure we treat the eye, this exposure keratitis, these big words, exposure keratitis and crowdo conjunctivitis, sicca, those are basically what's causing the horse's corneal ulcer that you start to notice um, because they're not, it's basically the lay term would be dry eye and they're not able to produce tears. And that's because that facial nerve stops working and is too inflamed to do its job. And then, sorry about that. Um, and then the next thing would be, we look at different surgeries um, and what we can do to alter the forces on that joint. Um, so sometimes surgery is not an option for everyone. Not everyone um, is wanting to take that step, which is totally fine. But if surgery is not an option for you, I don't think that, um, I think medical care is a good option to at least try and to start with. Um, and what medical care will look like if you were to bring your horse to um, the university, what we would probably recommend is doing a long course of TMS, any sort of broad spectrum antibiotic is good. And the duration is we typically will do um, about a month of that. And then adding in anti-inflammatory medications like buterbanamine, no preference there. It's just something to help get the inflammation down. And sometimes we'll also add in steroids such as dexamethasone or prednisolone. Um, and most of the time we add in steroids when we're dealing with vestibular disease, um, just because typically, based off kind of where the nerves sit, once you get vestibular disease involved, 
usually the bone's a little bit thicker. So kind of trying to calm down the inflammation as aggressively as you can is what we try to do. And then I've had a couple cases where supportive care is important. Horses that can't eat, they become what we call dysphagic because they've lost control of their tongue and they're not able to swallow anymore. Um, so sometimes you have to do that. And then we want to make sure that we care for the actual corneal ulcer if they're having an ulcer, whether that's topical meds, um, SPLs, which is basically a catheter that's in the eye to give meds through. We give IV meds through it. So what do our surgical treatments look like? Um, I think this disease is really cool because I think it, again, gives a really good um, transition period over time and how we've gotten better as veterinarians of providing better surgical options for horses and making it easier for them um, to go through surgery and have a better outcome. So back in the 90s, something called a partial stylohyoidectomy was performed. And that here we are with our hyoid apparatus again. And this little dot uh, line area that C is pointing to, basically what horses would do is they'd get anesthetized, a piece of this bone about this size, two, three centimeters would be removed. And we'll go a little bit more into all of these procedures. And then some complications arose with this surgery. So the next surgery was removing the serratohyoid bone entirely because they realized, well, our goal is to change the forces on the apparatus. So maybe we don't need to be this invasive and we can just take the bone away. So they started to take the bone, the serratohyoid bone away, which is this guy here. And... Um, in the early 2000s, they came out describing how you can take the bone away. It still has a good outcome. Everything's great. Well, then that transferred into what about these horses with bilateral disease? Can we take one of the serratohyoid bones or can we take both? So it led to people taking both and we realized, hey, we can take both and the horse still does well. So that's great. And then that has led to, well, can we transfer this from general anesthesia to standing? And some people remove the serratohyoid bone standing in certain cases if the clinical picture fits. Not all horses can tolerate it. Not every case is amenable to it, um, but sometimes that's an option and it's better for us to try to do it standing. And then what we here do at the university, which is our pride and joy, is we do a partial serratohyoidectomy. And what this is, is basically we remove a piece of the bone down here and then kind of let it be. And there's a reason we do that. And I'll explain that shortly, but that's what we do here. And we've had great success with it. So in the partial silo hyoidectomy, as you can see, these vessels and nerves run right along the silo hyoid bone. And so what happened when they were doing this procedure is they were leaving behind a blanket basically that continued to be able to produce cells to grow bone because of the proximity of these vessels. And when these vessels get nicked, they can cause severe hemorrhage because they're all arteries and it can be really difficult to stop the hemorrhage if you unfortunately touch them because it's a very tight space that you're working in. So leaving behind this blanket called the periosteum was kind of no choice so that you didn't harm the nerves or vessels in that area. And what that did is unfortunately, the horses would grow back bone. And when they grew back bone, the clinical signs kind of came back with vengeance and the horses didn't do well. And you can see here too, that there's lots of vessels still running around with this serratohyoid bone as well. So this next procedure that we'll talk about is not an easy one either. Um, so the complications where they regrew that bone and what that caused was return of signs or in surgery itself because those nerves are lying right along the bone. Damage happened to the nerves and they got dysphagic, which again means they can't swallow. And that is happening from a nerve called the hypoglossal nerve that's running with that bone. So then in the early 2000s, this is when they came up with the serratohyoidectomy. And this paper and this group of uh, doctors basically had three horses that had been treated with stylohyoidectomies, partial stylohyoidectomies. And they, this group was the group who realized, oh my gosh, the bone's growing back and it's not happy. And you can see these arrows are pointing, this isn't the best radiograph, but these arrows are pointing to the, the growth and reforming of the stylohyoid bone. 
And this is what prompted the investigators to say, hey, we have to find another way to try to help these horses. And when we talk about, we just want to change the dynamics of the way this apparatus moves and the forces on it, that's when they decided, hey, let's try to take out this stratohyde bone and see how that does. Knowing that and hypothesizing and thinking, hey, if we remove this bone, we change the force and you take the whole bone out so no bone can go back. So that kind of became the mainstay treatment that a lot of people and a lot of people will still do just a stratohyoidectomy from here on out. And what you do, as you can see, is we put them under general anesthesia typically. Um, we put them on their back in dorsal recumbency. And here you can see a stratohyoid bone on the right stratohyoid bone. And then this left one is missing. And this is a really cool CT uh, reconstruction of a horse after surgery. And what you do is you basically just take the bone out down here, and then you disconnect the bone here, and then you just pull the bone out. It sounds really easy. Um, I have to say that, unfortunately, it is very technically challenging surgery. Um, and it is not that easy. And mostly because you have those vessels running here and here, every place you're trying to take scissors to cut the bone, um, you have a vessel trying to stop you. <laughs> so here's a great outline of the vessels and nerves running with the stylohyoid bone and the stratohyoid, and then here with the stratohyoid and the basihyoid bone. And so it's important to avoid those, and it makes the surgery really challenging with most of the intraoperative complications being hemorrhage, because sometimes you can't see the vessels because they're embedded in muscles, and then all of a sudden they kind of just pop out. And this was a study that kind of looked, so once that paper in the early 2000s came out, that paper had good successes with the three horses going all back to work once they did that. So that became the mainstay treatment. And a lot of these horses, a lot of people started doing this surgery. And in this particular um, group of horses, of them, again, another representation of quarter horses being unfortunately overrepresented in the group, but of 15 horses, they all had THO, they all had a stratohyoidectomy, and their complications were two horses with hemorrhage, and they did not um, describe the amount of hemorrhage that they got, but it wasn't life-threatening, which is great. And then almost all of the horses returned to their previous level of work, which is extremely good. Um, and the biggest thing is this resolution of ataxia, the horses that get vestibular cochlear nerve deficits, that's the one um, we want to attack and get rid of the most. Um, and almost every horse achieved um, less ataxia or improved ataxia scores um, or had complete resolution of it. Sometimes you'll still have persistent cranial nerve deficits, even with the surgery, which is an important thing to realize. But usually they're more of cosmetic def deficits, like the ear droop or a little bit of a muzzle deviation but they'll get their blink back, they'll be able to produce tears, stuff like that, but not all clinical signs just completely go away. And then most recently, um, it was described to do the stratohyoidectomy standing. And this is just kind of so you can see when we take your horse to surgery, I thought this was a really cool picture to show you guys of what we are looking at and what we're feeling. Now, obviously we don't see this, we're all feeling all of this. And this is where the basihyoid bone here, and this is a stratohyoid bone here and here, if they have left-sided or right-sided disease. And then we pick whichever disease they have, that's the one we go after. And then what we do is you disarticulate the bone here. And so, disarticulating the, um, or I'm sorry, this is a stratohyoid bone over here, and you're disarticulating it here, and then it's connecting down here to your stylohyoid bone, and you're disconnecting it there. So um, again, this is a stratohyoid bone, this is the basihyoid bone, and this is where we're disarticulating it, and then it goes, tracks even deeper down to the stylohyoid bone where it articulates down there, and then that is in this these horses, they were able to remove the whole bone. I thought this was a cool picture to show of the vessels. This is a huge vein that runs right in the center of everything we want to do, which makes this whole surgery so challenging. And then this is an actual picture of, this is the stratohyoid bone 
it has been what we call disarticulated or unhinged, removed from the basal hyoid bone. And it's starting to be lifted out so that they can go in and try to take out the whole bone and go down to the um, other joint. So they were able to do this standing. It took them roughly an hour. Um, the same complications, hemorrhage, was their biggest um, issue they encountered, which is blood loss. They had lots of bleeding in these surgeries. And when they're standing, it makes it even harder to control the bleeding. So they had one horse that had to just have get some packing done and had to come back the next day to finish because they weren't able to see what they needed to do because of the amount of blood that was being produced. Um, they had both horses that were uncoordinated and horses coordinated be able to tolerate the disease, um, which I think is going to be always be a very clinician dependent situation um, based off safety for all the staff. And then this is a paper that came out in 2017. And um, I like to, in my presentations, to show you guys these papers because it drives a lot of the way we as veterinarians think and practice. And this paper was a big turning point for THO horses in general because what this paper showed was that in a long history and 14 years, they looked at horses treated surgically and horses treated medically at UC Davis. and Basically, the horses treated surgically had a better prognosis than the horses that only had medical treatment. So this is why if you bring a horse to us with THO or your veterinarian calls and says, I have concerns that I have a patient with THO that needs surgery, this is why we recommend it. Because to give your horse the best outcome, it's been shown that surgery is going to provide that outcome and give them the best chance of getting back to their normal life. As you can see in medical management, only 12%, which is such a low percent, returned to their previous use, and 13 ended up being euthanized for the disease, which is a lot. And then in the Serato hyoidectomy group, only one horse ended up being euthanized for the disease, whereas in 65% returned to their use. Still not a number that we like to see as veterinarians. We hope this number is usually an 80%, but it's certainly better than the 12%. So prognosis overall is pretty favorable, I should say, with surgery. Um, not to say, again, that if surgery is not an option for you, I definitely recommend medical management and at least trying if you want to try. It can just be long, a long road, but so can surgery. They typically will get back to their regular job. Most of our horses here have been able to return to the job. For the nerve, over time it heals and it doesn't, it loses the inflammation and it calms down. Corneal ulcers will typically resolve with treating the eye. If you have to enucleate it or take it out, we take it out um, and horses still do well with one eye. And then the biggest thing that's guiding the prognosis is what, did we do surgery or did we do medical management? And again, surgery is gonna provide the best option um, for the horse to get back to its normal life. So what do we do here at the university? So as I mentioned, we do something called the partial stratohyodectomy. And we only remove the lower part of the stratohyodectomy. And why do we do this? Because we were tired as a group. This is before I came here, but I can speak for the group. I'm tired of having horses trying to go down and disarticulate it from the stylohyoid bone and having um, prolonged time on the table and dealing with all those important structures and the risks of what can go wrong. So what um, Dr. Ernst was the one who kind of spearheaded this for us. He started, he said, you know what, I'm going to take half the bone. So he removed part of the bone and the horse did great. The horse got recovered from its clinical signs. And then another surgeon came in and for another case and was having trouble again, finding this articulation with the stylohyoid bone. And they finally decided, hey, we're just going to take half the bone and, and get out of here because we've been trying too long. And then all of a sudden these horses were doing so well, it's just become our our mainstay treatment. And most of these horses now, the goal is the less time that we can keep them anesthetized, the better. They, it's typically faster because we're not dissecting as much. It's creating less trauma to the horse in many ways. 
and we're providing the same outcome, if not a better outcome, than we have had um, described by all these other papers that I basically have mentioned to you tonight. Um, we also have done them standing here before. It, again, is very challenging, but depending on the horse, we've had cases um, that we've done standing and they've done really well, and that's what's important. And so this is an example of one of the horses we saw here. Um, we're currently, these pictures I was able to get because I'm in the process of writing a paper about this and submitting it to a journal. And here is a great view of the serrato bone on the radiograph, the basi hyoid bone and the stylo hyoid bone. And here this arrow is pointing to the space between these bones because what we wanted to prove was in the stylo hyoid ectomy, when they're removing part of the stylo hyoid bone, they're having bone regrowth. So what we wanted to prove is, hey, we can remove part of the bone and it doesn't grow back. And we are still able to provide a great outcome and there's still space. And what this space between these bones, what this means is that the apparatus, the dynamic with the change of removing part of the bone and disarticulating it from this bone down here, we've still been able to achieve that hyoid force change. And we've been able to take it off of the, in this case, it would be the left stylohyoid and petrous temporal bone. And you can kind of even see how thick this guy is down through here. So all these horses that we started doing partial stratohyoid ectomies on, I have uh, done rechecks on them or I've brought them back into the hospital if they're able to, um, by some amazing owners, I've been able to bring them back in and we've been doing CTs on them to be able to prove, hey, we, we did not have these issues that once was had. And not only that, the surgery is safer for the patient and the patients are still doing really well. So if you came to the university and you had concerns for THO or your vet sends you down because they have concerns for THO, what we'll do is we typically do a good neurologic exam with our internal medicine service. We would run, we would recommend a head CT if that's an available option for you. If not, we can do an endoscopy of the guttural pouch to take a peek. Um, and then we would probably start them depending on if this is a head tossing case, you're concerned the horse doesn't like taking the bit, we're concerned about doing dentals. In that case, we probably wouldn't be a horse that we immediately start on medical management. We would wait for surgery if that was an option. Otherwise, if the horse comes in acutely and it's very neurologic or the horse is um, a corneal ulcer and is dysphagic, can't chew, anything like that. That's when we get to start our medical therapy as soon as possible and then try to find a good time to do surgery on them when they've had some time with anti-inflammatories and medications to calm down the disease process before we go in there and, and change the disease process. Um, surgery is usually roughly anywhere from one to two hours. Most of our times are typically less than an hour. Um, but again, every horse is different. Every horse has different anatomy. But our goal is to get them off the table as soon as we can. And then what a discharge is like after a horse goes through this surgery, it, it's really case dependent. I wish I could give like a hard answer. My, our standard protocol here is four weeks in a stall with light hand walking and grazing. But if you have a super ataxic horse, um, very uncoordinated horse, we have to wait um, for time to turn that horse out or to move that horse or to do things with that horse. And time, even after surgery, it's not like we do the surgery and all of a sudden the clinical signs are gone. We've done the surgery, we've changed the forces on the apparatus, and now the nerve can heal. And that's kind of what we're looking for. So sometimes it still takes time um, for the horse's clinical signs that we see to resolve, but in time they will resolve. And we typically will see the best improvement within the first six months. Um, for the more subtle cases, if you have a horse that just has facial nerve paralysis, that horse might be able to go back to work within eight weeks. Why I say eight weeks is we do a lot of messing around and this is an upper airway, a very delicate area in the horse. So I like to give them lots of time off so that we can make sure that area has healed and the horse is doing well before we start changing things and putting them back into work. So in summary, the biggest thing is the cause of THO, we really don't understand, but we know it's some sort of osteoarthritic degenerative process or it's caused by an ear infection. If you have a quarter horse or cribber, I hope I don't see you, but it could happen. And then surgery is gonna provide a better outcome than medical therapy. And this is just a plug for my um, surgery baby, but personally, this is not by any means 
yet proven in the literature, but soon to be that a partial steratohyoidectomy will give you the best option for your horse. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Booth. Um, we've had, we do have some questions here. I think a couple of these you've already answered, but I will just go through them. And then um, if you'd like, you can just, um, um, just uh, what do I want to say? Um, speak to them. So one of the one of the one of the first question is: After surgery, can THO or at least the bony overgrowth portion that was partially cut out come back and cause more issues after a few years? Yeah. So I kind of touched on that. So no. Um, right now we've proven I have horses two or three years out that have not showed signs again. And then we have those CTs showing that the bone did not regrow. So when we do the partial stratohyoidectomy, we've been able to prove that that doesn't happen and that we're still able to maintain um, the, the same force, force change that we originally did. Okay. And I, I believe you addressed this as well, but what is the return to work schedule post recovery? In a very simple case, I think they can go back to work within six weeks. In a more complicated case, if they're ataxic, that's when we would have to kind of just play it by ear. And I usually have that uh, your primary vet recheck them if, or we can recheck them depending on what the situation is, but um, have them recheck before turning them out and before that. Okay. Um, and this one you also addressed, but if you want to just um, provide the information again, it's what are the earliest clinical signs? The earliest are going to be head tossing, um, reluctance to come into a frame. They start to get head shy, ears, anything with their ears if they get sensitive. Um, those would probably be the biggest ones. Some people will um, observe abnormal chewing, stuff like that. Okay. What are the, um, are there early warning signs that are detectable during a routine dental exam? Unfortunately, and when it comes to dental exam, you can't the the tough part is the dental itself no you can't see anything but what happens sometimes is we've had cases where your vet goes out does an exam and is doing a dental and when they open with the specula the because we don't know what's going on in there um and a horse has tho and we don't know because it's what we call subclinical it's basically hiding that when they when um the vet opens up the speculum all of a sudden the horse can become acutely ataxic or something because what happens is that stress change ended up fracturing the bone but no one knew because your horse didn't show any clinical signs has been completely normal sometimes this disease can lay latent for years and you we never know that the horse has it sometimes it's just a an extra finding and so that can be the frustrating part um that's a little bit more on the rare side when it comes to the dentals and that happening, but it can definitely happen. And usually after a horse has a surgery or is diagnosed with THO, we've done the treatment, we always try to make sure we're in communication with the vet or with whoever's doing the dental work that they know they have to be careful when opening the, the mouth because now we know that the horse is THO. Okay, thank you. Uh, can THO result in decreased or loss of balance? I, you did talk about this as well. Um, loss of balance because of its connection to the hyoid apparatus. So yes, it's not necessarily the connection of the hyoid apparatus. It's because the vestibular cochlear nerve, that nerve runs with the apparatus. And when the apparatus becomes big or when that joint becomes big and proliferative, it causes inflammation and pressure on that nerve. And then that nerve becomes inflamed. And then the horse shows, it, like in this picture, a head tilt. Um, and, and can show ataxic, become uncoordinated, and um, sometimes they become dysphagic. Okay. So here's some questions from tonight that came in. Will Adequan help with the situation? I think it's a great question. Um, in theory, it could because there's still joints, um, but I, I think Adequan is expensive, and to be able to promote it, Adequan for the specific disease, I would say I wouldn't just go by Adequan for that, but I think that's a really good question and it certainly wouldn't hurt. Okay. Is acupuncture able to assist horses with THO in any way? Another really good question. So I definitely think acupuncture had a huge believer in it. I love having horses and horse owners who are willing to handle acupuncture and Yes, I think it has a big place, especially with healing of the nerves, calming down inflammation. I think acupuncture can only make things better. 
Now, whether acupuncture could replace surgery, I'm not 100% convinced because I think ultimately you have to change the force, but could they work together? Or if surgery wasn't an option for your horse, then acupuncture was, then I would definitely encourage at least trying acupuncture for sure. Okay. And then the last question is, is there a particular age for the horse when this occurs? I would say most commonly we're seeing this disease in horses that are 15 and over. Um, but again, I have seen it in three-year-olds, five-year-olds. Uh, the one horse I showed was a six-month-old thoroughbred. So um, it definitely, unfortunately, can be seen in really young horses. But for the most part, they're typically middle-aged to older, starting at like 15 or so. Okay. Well, I think that is all the questions we have tonight, Allison. I didn't know, Dr. Booth, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close? No, I'm happy I was able to talk about THO. It's my favorite disease. Um, so I hope I was able to answer questions. And if you have any other questions, well, feel free to email or call in. I chat with people all the time about it. Well, thank you, Dr. Booth. We'd yeah. like to say a special thank you for taking time to do this. I know your schedule is pretty, pretty busy these days. Um, and we appreciate your insights. Um, and thank you to our many participants that shared thoughtful questions in advance and during their presentation. Our Piper, Piper Equine Hospital is located on our St. Paul campus and is open for you 24-7. If you enjoyed the learning and information provided tonight, we encourage you to visit our website, website at www.equine.umn.edu or feel free to reach out to us directly. And lastly, we hope you will consider supporting our equine program, whether your gift is for clinical outreach service, education of the next generation of our equine practitioners, or towards the advancement of equine research, its impact makes a big difference in the lives of horses and the next generation of equine practitioners. Thank you again for attending our equine webinar presented by Dr. Allison and Booth. And Allison Booth, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.